of Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Beloved in the Lord, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A man said, let me ask you a question. Is your church spirit-filled? I said, uh, excuse me? He said, I say, is your church spirit-filled? This is many years ago. Our family had just moved to town to start a local church. And when I told the man about it, this is what he wanted to know. If it was spirit-filled. I think he whistled his ass, if I recall. I told him, I hope so. Because if not, if there's no Holy Spirit at our church, then we are hurting for certain. He wasn't satisfied with that answer. Because as I learned later, being spirit-filled is code. It's code for does your church practice speaking in tongues? That is the gibberish that Pentecostals teach that is evidence of them being baptized by the Holy Ghost. You see, you're, you're water baptized, but you're just on the JV team with Jesus. If you want to move up to the varsity in their understanding, then you got to be baptized by the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Well, in our gospel lesson, it is the eve before the crucifixion. Jesus is preparing the disciples for what is coming after his death, after even his resurrection. And he comforts them by promising to send them the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter who will be poured out upon them. And this in our church year in just what? Three, four weeks from now, maybe not even that long, is what we will observe here on Sunday morning with Pentecost. Now look, the Holy Spirit has always been around. He is the eternal God, eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. He's even active at the very beginning of creation and evidence throughout the entire Old Testament. King David, you might recall, prayed that God would not take the Holy Spirit from him. This is exactly what we will sing just here in a few moments. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Why did David pray that? Because David had witnessed what happened to King Saul when the Holy Spirit was removed from King Saul. He went what? He went crazy. He became demonically possessed even. David says, I don't want anything to do with that. Moses, way before David said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. But there's something very unique that happens after the ascension of Christ. The Holy Spirit is to be poured out on all flesh, just as Moses had hoped, just as Joel and Jesus Christ promised, just as Peter preached. Peter said, if you recall, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus in our lesson unfolds this teaching by telling His disciples exactly what the Holy Spirit will do and it is a three-fold work. Imagine that. A three-fold work. Hear it again. And when He, the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So first, the Spirit convicts the world of sin because they do not believe in me. Now you would think one would not need the Holy Spirit to come to this conclusion, but it is a conviction which does not come without divine intervention. For what do most people think of themselves? Most people think of themselves as being a pretty good person. 
I mean, nobody's perfect, they say, but yeah, I'm okay. This is what most people believe. All the while, they hate the word of God. They despise the commandments of God. They reject Jesus as the son of God and the savior of the world, and instead accept a Jesus in their own making. Yet the first work of the Holy Spirit is to bring the crushing weight of the law to bear on the sinner's conscience, showing them the rottenness and foulness of their deeds, the foulness of their words, and the repulsive stench which comes from unbelief. But the Holy Spirit doesn't speak with His own voice to do this. Nor does the Holy Spirit speak secretly in hidden messages in our heart where we have to decode our impulses or our impressions, our intuitions, our dreams, or our feelings. Folks, there's no assurance in any of that, nor is there any true comfort there. The Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. The Word spoken, the Word read, and the Word preached. And he does it with our own voices. The voice of his children. The voice of the church. And that is done here in this pulpit each and every Sunday. And you do it as well in your homes with your family members. You do it in your various vocations as well. The Spirit is attached to the Word. Rebuking the world for its sin and for not believing in the only one who can take sin away. Adding that the only way to escape the guilt and the condemnation of sin is to flee in faith to Christ Jesus. Now, of course, in these gray and these latter days, one is tempted to think that the power of the Holy Spirit seems weak. Like he's getting old. I mean, he's been around for a long time, you know? Like he's wearing out somehow. For the world, it seems, has gone completely mad to the point that it cannot even recognize who is a woman and who is a man. Did you read the article just this week? of the kid at the Catholic school who is expelled from school or maybe just kicked out of school for a couple days for wearing a shirt that says there are only two genders? The world is insane! And then when you look at the church, my goodness, false doctrine taints many pulpits and the pure teaching of the Catholic Church, rather, or the Church Catholic, I should say, is taught and believed by an ever-dwindling number of the faithful. But don't deceive yourself. The Holy Spirit's help remains with the Church, just as Jesus promised, doing so until the very last day when the trumpet is blown and the skies roll back as a scroll. And we can take great comfort in the fact that the Holy Spirit is constantly at work rebuking sin wherever the Word of God is preached. And some of those sinners, like you and me, repent and believe in Christ Jesus, thereby having our sins washed away in holy baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit as a gift, just as Peter says, and there He clothes us with true righteousness, that being the righteousness of Christ. Now, speaking of righteousness, this is exactly what Jesus explains. It brings us to the second work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict the world, con of, excuse me, convict the world concerning righteousness. He says, because I go to the Father. Meaning, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise, and I'm going to ascend. The world, however, has a different view of righteousness. It either thinks it's righteous enough already, or it imagines that one can become righteous all on their own based on the things that they do or that they don't do. Now look, we're all sinful by nature. We just sang it together. I was born in sin. We're sinful by nature down to the very core of our being. 
And this is a corruption that clings to our nature. And coming to believe this is the first work of the Holy Spirit. The only way, therefore, to become righteous before God is through faith in the righteous one, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The one who lived here for 33 years. The world saw him, beheld him, they talked with him, they ate with him, and then, of course, they crucified him. And now he is unseen. No one can be righteous before God unless he who is righteous delivers the goods. Think of the Holy Spirit as being the sanctified FedEx man. He brings Christ's righteousness to you. He delivers it. Instead of judging us then as sinners, which we are, instead of judging us as unholy, which we are, instead of casting us far from His face, which He could, God the Father Almighty declares us, declares each of you to be righteous, to be holy, to be sinless in His sight. And this righteousness, which we so desperately need, is given through the means of grace where the Holy Spirit delivers all that Jesus won in the preaching of the Gospel, in the waters of Holy Baptism, in His Holy Supper, and it's received through faith. Beloved, righteousness is not found at Walmart. It's found here in His church because this is where the invisible Christ gives us His righteousness through the working of the Holy Spirit in the appointed means. It's rightly said that outside of the Christian church there is no salvation. This is what the church fathers used to say. But inside the Christian church there is salvation and all are invited by the Holy Spirit to enter into it. Third, the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning judgment, he says, because the ruler of this world, and there is a ruler of this world, folks, and he's not on the front page of your paper, but he is there. But it says the ruler of this world is judged. Again, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the unbelieving world refuses to not acknowledge Jesus Christ as judge and that Christ will again come in judgment. These days, people are more afraid of global warming than they are the judgment of God. They're more afraid of climate change or the next pandemic. People pretend if there is a judgment day, they'll escape it. Furthermore, people say hell does not exist. And if it does, it's only for really, 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 really bad people. And this shows them, this is where the Holy Spirit rather shows them how wrong they are. Look, it is the devil who is the father of lies and the Holy Spirit who is the spirit of truth. And the truth is, if the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not your God, then the devil is your ruler. And all who remain in the devil's kingdom, who continue as members of the unbelieving world, will receive the exact same judgment as their ruler, cast into outer darkness forever. It's horrible to think of this. The devil is judged. But the Holy Spirit comes and says to all, but you don't need to be. So what does the Holy Spirit say? He says, flee from the devil's kingdom. Come into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Christ, where there is forgiveness for every sin and no condemnation. It is these who pass from death to life. Because the truth is Jesus rules, Jesus reigns, and all he does it all for the sake of his church. We do not determine spiritual truth from what we see. We are Christians, so we determine spiritual truth from what we 
right here. It's like a lovely lady just this past week from a ministry many, many years ago called me out of the blue. She said, I've been thinking about you. I've been looking for you. And I wanted to thank you. I said, my goodness, what a day. Thank you so much. You're so sweet. We started talking about our church that she's attending. And I was telling her about the Lutheran church and the beautiful doctrines here. And she said, you know, the way that you look for a church is that you've got to find the heart of the church. I thought, do I let her get away with that or not? Uh, I can't let you get away with that. I said, you know like I do. Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven there means doctrine. What matters in a local church is the doctrine meaning what they teach, believe, and confess. Now hopefully that doctrine is going to manifest, that right doctrine is going to manifest, manifest itself into what? A heart that loves the Lord and loves the neighbor as thyself. So she's somewhat right. But let's get a little bit deeper. Find the doctrine that then shows forth the heart that is in, on fire for him, inflamed for others. Again, we as Christians, we determine spiritual truth from what we hear. And it is the Holy Spirit who brings this truth to us in the words of the prophets, in the words of the apostles, and in the preaching of the word. Because faith comes by hearing or seeing? Yeah, hearing. Faith is nourished. It's how the Holy Spirit works. So let's go back to where we started with that man who asked me many years ago, is your church I can't go, spirit filled? You bet your bippy it is. For without the Holy Spirit, there is no absolution of sins. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no holy baptism. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no holy communion. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no power of God in the preaching of the gospel. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no divine help in the building of His church. But with the Holy Spirit, there's all of this. And so much more. This is the time of the Helper. This is the time of the Holy Spirit, who, as we learn in the small catechism, calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one truth. So folks, we've all got one foot in the grave. And when it comes your time to get in that coffin, we can all say thanks to the Holy Spirit for keeping this beloved brother, keeping this beloved sister in the Lord in the one true faith all the days of their life. Thanks be to God and to this wonderful gift that He has given to us in His Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise together.